Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another edition of the Rotopros.com Best DFS show that just happens to come out here on 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six on all the main sites. This is another EPL breakdown for Match Week 37, Saturday, May 4th, 2019. It's only a three game slate and it's the second last week of the season. However, I think both of those factors actually play into some really interesting takes for both cash and GPP in each of these three games. So, yeah, let's take a quick look at the schedule. First game of the slate, we have Southampton making the trip from the South Coast into London to play West Ham. Next game of the slate, we have Fulham making the trip from London into Wolverhampton to play Wolves. And the final game of the slate, we have Crystal Palace making the trip from London into Wales to play Cardiff City. Uh, yeah, let's uh, just jump right into this. First game, Southampton at West Ham. Southampton are actually coming into this in really bad form. They're winless in three straight and four of the previous five. They've won only one of the previous five and three of their previous ten away games. Uh, they've lost three of those five. However, they've lost only four of those previous ten away games. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they do have a new manager, and while he did produce results for quite some time, the honeymoon is generally over, and their results are starting to dip. Um, they've won only four of their 18 away games this season. Uh, with 10 of their 16 uh, losses this season coming away from home. So I'm driving home the point here. They just haven't been as good away from home all season. Uh, So while that may not draw itself to cash, it could lend itself a little bit more to GPP. Uh, especially uh, when they've conceded uh, at least two goals in three of their last five away games. Uh, so, yeah, that kind of draws itself to two different facts. The first one is that if they are going to produce produce any kind of result, they're going to need to score at least twice, uh, and, or they should have to. And, and the second part of that, if the clean sheet does hit, it will be extremely low-owned. Uh, so, yeah, let's uh, take a quick look here at uh, Southampton, uh, jump right into them. Uh, it's it's an interesting situation with Southampton where their results so, so have been so bad the past few weeks that not many people are going to be interested in jumping on them, especially uh, when you look at someone like Angus Gunn. Now, I've been driving home the Angus Gunn story all season, and at least if we look at the past couple of results here, uh, we could uh, expect a positive game. It's just uh, what kind of positive game. And from 4.6K, that's a pretty big salary from someone who has been pulling off a few too many negatives uh, in the recent results. So, yeah, uh, I don't mind him for GPP because he does have uh, acceptable uh, defensive options, but in terms of uh, cash options, you really can't jump into Angus Gunn at all there. And The real reason you can use Angus Gunn in GPP is because Ryan Bertrand is a serviceable serviceable defender when he does hit some kind of a ceiling. Uh, He will need a clean sheet for that, but uh, yeah, again, it's not a whole lot to look at the Southampton defensive side here in terms of the going forward there's a lot more to look at uh ward press is uh an elite player he hasn't really gotten the opportunity to show his true form until uh the most recent of recent weeks uh but he has been playing very well uh, I'm not again interested as, as much as him in him from 8.3k when we look at some of the other options this slate uh but uh one of the interesting things about Southampton is that, well, first of all, they usually take off the forwards, don't play 90 minutes. They take off their forwards. So if there is a forward you're interested in on Southampton, make sure to check to see that they actually have 90-minute games in the repertoire. This is like a ceiling right here. And while that is acceptable, it's still not 90 minutes. And it's it's just a risk. So there's a GP. A GPP option if you are interested in someone like Shane Long, but uh, I would rather jump on someone like Nathan Redmond if you are going to use anyone in Southampton uh, just because 7.3k is a much more acceptable salary for him to finish 8 to 15 fantasy points which is kind of the range that all these guys could finish in, could being the, the big question mark there. Uh, the interesting, or I should say, the, the thing to remember for Southampton is that they tend to have a random starter every once in a while and that random starter, especially in a three-game slate, could pay all the dividends here so uh, don't sleep on Southampton if they throw in a random starter that looks to be playing in some sort of an effective DFS role for either site uh, but uh, in terms of uh, a, an overall result um, the DFS side of things just is is more viable to go West Ham now West Ham is undefeated in back-to-back games they are winless however in back-to-back home games uh, they've scored at least twice in four of the previous five games 
they're just one of the most unpredictable and inconsistent teams of the season. I think their back-to-back home losses uh, is the wrong side of the inconsistency, and we should be seeing a jump back here. Um, they've lost only two of their previous ten at home. They've just been a much better home side, and even that comes with the fact that a lot of the season they just weren't scoring for large swaths of the season at home. So they still do fine results. Of their 13 wins this season, eight of them did come at home. Uh, and uh, they did uh, win uh, eight of their uh, 18 home games this season, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, one of the interesting things for me here is that in their previous 10 home games, uh, there's been at least two two goals in eight of the past 10 games, and both teams have scored in nine of the past 10 games. So, uh, again, that lends its hand to kind of, if you remember DFS last weekend in soccer, Southampton and Bourne that just went at it and completely tore the slate to shreds. Uh, they were both scoring and allowing goals at a, a very high rate. Uh, so, yeah, um, I'm not expecting that kind of same uh, output this late, especially from Southampton. Uh, but in terms of uh, a goaltender option, Fubanski isn't the worst option, that's for sure. Um, he managed to turn things around after uh, allowing consistent amount of goals there for quite some time. But the big difference here that I, I'm going to draw a reference to is that while he was allowing two goals a game, he was still uh, finishing above uh, above the EV uh, standard with only one uh, really, I shouldn't say above EV if you're considering salary, but in terms of just raw points, uh, he didn't finish negative. So, yeah, um, it's important that he got the win last week and uh, a, a really huge result there. But my, my point is that this is a really solid floor to build off of a, a win with. And considering Southampton's really poor results recently, uh, that's something to consider. Now, uh, depending if uh, Cresswell gets the start, I'm really not that interested at him from 5.2K. That just isn't something that I'm uh, jumping on. Uh, but in, in terms of a floor, uh, it is there. Uh, I, I'm kind of hoping that he doesn't start. He hasn't been starting for the last little bit. Uh, but in, in exchange for that, you could probably grab uh, Masuaku in the same position for 90 minutes uh, for a relatively the same type of floor. Without See, the thing with Cresswell is that he has a lot of different roles uh, within West Ham. He crosses the ball a lot more, but he doesn't necessarily uh, produce as well uh, as we would hope from 5.2K this slate. Uh, th this game is a little bit overpriced in my opinion. I think a lot of that is based off of recent results. Uh, one guy I am very interested in is Ryan Fredericks uh, from only 4.2K. If you're looking to pair someone with Fabanski, Fredericks is definitely the first guy I, I would go to. And I think he's even cash viable if you like this slate. 4.2K is just a really accessible salary. So I don't hate him. Uh, Ryan Fredericks, West Ham, 4.2K defensive option. Uh, now, as you go into the midfield here, uh, it, it'll be interesting again to see who gets 90 minutes. Uh, Antonio's been pulling them off as of late, uh, but it, it sucks because a lot of the best options for West Ham are down in the the low uh, 4K ranges here with Lanzini, Nasri, Noble, that kind of thing. Um, and... It, it, again, it, it, it's interesting to see who gets the 90 minutes. That's an issue in both sides of this game. This game just isn't as appealing for me as it may be for other people. I think Philippe Anderson does hold some relevance because he does so put in solid 90-minute games. But outside of that, you're, you're really drawing straws and hoping that someone can pull it off. Like This is a huge issue whenever you consider uh, he's putting in almost uh, 10 crosses and not coming anywhere close to double digits. So, uh, yeah, a big issue there uh, he would still need three or four crosses on either side of that to draw any kind of a double digit floor uh, which you would need from someone at 8k this slate so uh, Antonio you could probably chase in GPP uh, from 8.5k it's kind of an Antonio or James Ward pro side of things there I don't even hate a Mark Noble chase his minutes have been a little bit concerning but it isn't that shy of 90 minutes that's a big deal and really what you're hoping for is a penalty shot uh, that's that's really what I'm chasing with Mark Noble, but it'll be interesting to see who's on the bench. If Nazri or Lanzini can somehow draw in, um, they are world-class elite players that can really change games. And 
Uh, by all definition, I, I keep calling people out. If you're willing to play Ozil at three point whatever or at four point whatever, you should be able to play Lanzini or Nasri at uh, 4.4 or 4.3K. Uh, and uh, up front for West Ham, again, uh, you you have just minutes issues all around the board. Uh, so it, it's interesting, it, interesting to see who starts and who's on the bench. Uh, obviously, Arnie is someone I'm always interested in. Uh, but in, in terms of minutes, again, it's been a really uh, serious risk to try and rely on something like that. Now, um, what do you really need from 5.6K? I'm not sure if I'm being 100% honest. I think Arnautovic makes sense from this kind of salary. Uh, would I use him in cash? No, uh, but from a GPP filler, absolutely. Uh, I have no issue using him if he gets to start in GPP. Uh, chase a goal because a goal and you're you're at around the 2.5K hump, uh, which uh, would be passable enough for GPP from that salary, this slate. It's only three games, so you really don't need too much to succeed. You just need it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I don't think it is in this game, this slate. Uh, the final score, I think, would be something like a 1-1, 2-1 final. I would like it to be a one nothing either way. Uh, preferably a West Ham one nothing win. Preferably off a penalty shot so no one else gets an assist and there's no other excess points you have to contend with. And you can get a really condensed uh, Ernie or uh, Mark Noble goal. But uh, in terms of cash, I would go Ryan Fredericks. And maybe if he... Yeah... Redmond on uh, Southampton and maybe some James Ward Prowse if you want to keep chasing. But uh, final score West Ham will score and Southampton won't score a lot. Next game on the slate, we have Fulham making the trip uh, over to uh, Wolverhampton. Really interesting game. Um, however, you want to take Fulham as however you want to take them, really. Uh, they are technically one of the league's worst team. They are the league's worst away side, but they're coming into this red hot. They've won three straight without conceding. Uh, however, they have conceded. 44 away goals this season uh, in 18 games. So if there is a time where uh, we can get back on a trend, it's definitely Fulham away from home. Uh, they have only one away win all season. It came last away versus Bournemouth. And previous to that, uh, they have uh, they they were they've lost 15 of their 18 away games this season. Let's put it that way. Absolute disaster away from home. Um, they lost, I think it was uh, seven or eight straight previous to uh, this last game, and uh, 13 straight away games without scoring more than a single goal. So that's the real question here: is that can Fulham keep Wolves under a goal? Now. I'll be 100% honest here. Both sides are drawing into frustration for me. I've intentionally skipped out on Sergio Rico for three straight games. And for three straight weeks, it's absolutely haunted me. Like, unbelievable. Um, I didn't foresee Cardiff getting eight shots on goal. I didn't foresee another clean sheet. I didn't foresee necessarily an easy Fulham win. Uh, so, yeah. It definitely happened, and Sergio Rico cleaned the slate again. He's just improved, improved, improved each slate. Uh, so it, it's kind of tough. Uh, but uh, again, back line, Joe Bryan found double digits, was one of the few defenders to do such from such an easy ride. I actually took him. I fell on him in cash with literally like 40 seconds to go. It didn't help me that much, but uh, it was still a big deal there. Uh, so Joe Bryan... Uh, he is really the only option if you're going to play Sergio Rico. Just play Joe Bryan. Don't worry about anyone else. Callum Chambers, no, I'm still not interested. Even with three straight clean sheets, uh, he's not getting over five fantasy points. So there's really nothing to look at there. Um, so, yeah, really one place I'm drawing a lot of interest in this slate is Ryan Sessegnon, 4.8K. Uh Fulham has just been playing a lot better the past few games. Am I necessarily looking for this in cash? No, but for GPP, I think Ryan Sessegnon makes a lot of sense this slate, especially in a multi-game stack, which is something I'm chasing this slate, uh, where you basically just stack two games, uh, two teams, uh, midfield forward, midfield forward, and uh, take a defensive stack, and then you're basically set with just however you want to fill with the alternate, just making sure you get three different teams in, obviously. Uh, but yeah, in terms of cash or GPP, I'd really just only look at GPP uh, with Fulham uh, in terms of 
the back line. If you want to do Sergio Rico, if you want to do Joe Bryan, uh, if you want to do a, an offensive stack, I would definitely use uh, Sessegnon. Uh, but uh, on top of that, Mitrovic is my major lock of this slate. 6.7K. He's been doing more than enough to be cash viable. Going up against Wolves, uh, I really don't mind. It's 6.7K. He's the odd man out for me this slate in terms of the salary. That just doesn't make sense. So, yeah, I really don't mind some Mitrovic. Uh, even if he finishes with six fantasy points, that's totally fine from 6.7K in this three-game slate. And, again, another really good offensive option this slate is Ryan Babel, 7.9K. Seeing enough uh, close to 90 minutes where it doesn't really matter, and he's been seeing a lot of double digits. Again, this doesn't ruin you uh, from a, a three-game slate kind of thing. Uh, lower than that does, but uh, finishing anything at seven, six, seven fantasy points and above, uh, as long as you're not spending an elite salary, you should be fine this slate. Uh, there just won't be enough craziness. There shouldn't be enough craziness, knock on wood, uh, to happen. So, yeah, uh, and then up front, there really isn't too much to look at. I'd rather just use Sessegnon and try and uh, get him, uh, uh, manipulate the midfield forward option with him. So, yeah, for me, Fulham, uh, just Mitrovic. Uh, outside of that, I'm really not as interested. Interested Now, in terms of Wolves, they're coming into this uh, in actually really hot form right now. They're undefeated in three straight, winning back-to-back -back games. They've lost only one of their previous five and three of their previous ten games. They're way better at home. They're undefeated in seven straight home games, winning five of those seven games. They've lost only five of their 18 home games this season, winning half of them, nine of those 18s. They've conceded less Less than a goal in six of the previous seven games. Uh, so this is a situation here where we can look at Wolves just being a solid team. And they're battling out with Everton. And while I'm recording this, the Everton Burnley result still hasn't been in any way set. So it, it, it's hard to tell. Uh, so yeah, um, the Wolves and Everton are battling it out right now for seventh and eighth. Uh, and depending on how Everton does, Wolves may be pressured here to win uh, outright now. The big thing for Wolves has been all season. They dropped their quality down to the team they're playing. and uh, Or uh, contrary to that, they step up to the quality of team they're playing. Uh, they generally have issues playing against teams that have no business tying their boots. So I'm not as like super keen on Wolves in terms of some sort of uh, like full-out game stack. Again, this is kind of frustrating where Sergio Rico has, again, week after week after week been doing so well. And I'm finding the same issue here with Jota, who the most expensive player of the slate at 9.4K has just continued to produce for three straight weeks. You can, you can understand my results for the past three weeks have been a little bit skewed because I've been refuting these uh, plays because they don't necessarily make this much sense. Uh, so yeah, it, it's been tough, but I don't necessarily believe still Jota is a real option again this slate. And I've still continue to fade Jota. Maybe that's a bad play. Uh, it's just I know that he isn't, especially now 9.4k. He wasn't viable before at the salaries. He definitely isn't now. But we'll get to that. Uh, starting with Rio Patricio, obviously the most expensive keeper of the slate. I'm really not that interested. Um, I would rather chase uh, Sergio Rico from 3.8k, the guy who's pulled off 20 fantasy points nearly uh, worthy uh, in the past three slates. I know it's been uh, not, uh, but it's been a uh, very, very good outing. So, yeah, it's um, 5.7k just isn't really something I'm chasing for someone complete opposite results. Uh, so, yeah, isn't really a lot there for me. And in terms of the defenders, it's even more driven home. Um, the, um, never seen that before. There we go. Let's just keep doing that. Someone like Johnny, um, this is the only real option from Wolves. So if you do get the anchoring to play uh, a Wolves defensive player at all, I would definitely stay away from Rio Patricio's salary and uh, stick with someone like Johnny at 4.8K and hope he can draw some kind of floor from under 5K uh, because he's more than capable of doing that. Uh, and then going into the midfield, again, Moutinho, really good player, real life, uh, will draw close to double digits, plays 90 minutes, and is playing the worst away side in the league. So I really don't hate Moutinho. 7.1K is just quite simply too cheap this slate. Um, 
Outside of that, I don't really have too much interest there in the midfield. And then uh, up front, like I said, I'm not keen on playing Jota. A lot of this has to do with the fact that outside of what he does, he doesn't really have like a superior floor. Uh, I understand there's the contrary, but uh, yeah, I would rather take Mitrovic for the exact same type of uh, peripheral stats outside the goals and the assists. Hope Mitrovic catches that and uh, with the less ownership and nearly three odd thousand dollars in salary savings on DraftKings. So that's just my take on Jota versus Jimenez, but you can Motinho, Mitrovic, and Cash. I think that's not the worst idea of this slate. Um, but uh, in terms of a, a final, uh, it, it's tough again. Like, I don't want to say all the goals are going to come in the final game, but I do think that. Uh, it, it, this does look like a, a, even a 0-0 draw or a one nothing Fulham or Wolves win. Maybe 1-1, one, one, uh, maybe even a, a penalty shot goal or a free kick goal from someone like Ruben, uh, Ruben uh, Neves on Wolves, uh, who from 5K isn't the worst option himself for either format. So, yeah, uh, I really like uh, that as well. Uh this isn't even the worst stack for either format, honestly. Uh, they both have superior floor, and they're both way too cheap, and they're both playing an incredibly bad side. Now, I will restate, it's been all season. Wolves continues to fall down their quality to teams they're playing, and very few will have lesser quality than Fulham away. However, Fulham's recent results may suggest the otherwise. I'll say a 2 nothing Wolves win. Let's say that. How's that for everyone? Uh, Wolves 2, Fulham 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wolves 2, Fulham 1. Yeah, I can't say 2 nothing because then Metrovic's useless. But yeah, I'll say uh, uh, Wolves 2, Fulham 1, final score. Final game of the slate. We have Crystal Palace making the trip from London into Wales to play Cardiff. Really interesting game. A couple ways you can take this. So Palace are coming into this back, undefeated in back-to-back games. So they've lost only two of their previous five. They've alternated a win and a loss now for 10 straight games. So I should say win and loss. Up until last game's draw with Everton 0-0, they alternated a win and loss. Uh, last game would have been their loss. Uh, however, it was a draw. They're due for a win. Let's put it that way. They, they are far, 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 far better away from home. A lot of that has to do with the fact they're just not as good at home. Just not good at home, but uh, far better away from home this season. They've won back-to-back away games four of their previous five away and six of their previous ten. Eight of their 12 wins this season have come away from home. Uh, they've won eight of their 18 away wins, obviously. Compare that to only four uh, of 18 at home. And uh, obviously, too, they, they have uh, twice as many away goals uh, than they do at home. Uh, so I think it's a 29 to 14 or a 30 to 15, literally that kind of separation. So Palace is just a far, far better team away from home. A lot of that has to do with the fact that nobody scores at the Palace home field while Palace scores a lot of goals away from home. But uh, yeah, the first place I'm definitely looking this slate is uh, Gueda at 4.7k. Too cheap uh, going up against a card of side who is too bad. So yeah, I really don't mind Gueda 4.7k. He has really interesting defensive options, whether it's Juan Binsaka at 5.1k. Probably one of the best peripheral players in the entire league who will always provide you with a really solid floor. If he happens to catch something, you're absolutely flying, potentially breaking the slate. All you need is a goal or an assist, and he could complete, completely change the outcome for your slate. And uh, in general, Palace have really interesting defensive options. A lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, a lot of them uh, tend to get forward at ridiculous rates. Uh, so yeah, I, I really wouldn't uh, shy too deeply outside of taking other Palace uh, defensive options. Uh, it's interesting to see, obviously, DraftKings isn't letting me open up some stuff here, but that's okay. We'll just keep trucking along. Um, see who the center backs are when they start. It's probably going to be Scott Dan and Joel Ward. Uh, but if one of them happen to be on the wing, uh, don't shy away from uh, taking a, a clean sheet chase with Crystal Palace. This is where it gets interesting. Uh, you're going to want uh, two of these three guys. Emil Trevec, who I call Millie, Zaha, or Townsend. Is it working nice? Okay, so yeah. Townsend's definitely the least favorite of the three for me. I think he's the least 
GPP option. Uh, definitely not a cash option for me. He hasn't been seeing enough minutes and uh, really doing enough uh, in, ter- in terms of his floor anymore. So it's, uh, I'll shy away from him. It, generally, him and Max Mayer take each other off, which is too bad. I would like to use him, uh, Max Mayer, at 5.2K, but that's been an issue. Uh, so, yeah, uh, really uh, a lot of this will circle around Milicevic and uh, Zaha and where you want to go. Obviously, I think Zaha makes more sense for GPP and Milicevic makes a lot more sense for cash. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of uh, where you go from there, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I would take Milicevic, on, honestly, in either format. Probably one of my favorite plays is Slade from 7.7K. Will cross the ball a ton, takes the penalty shots. Cardiff just isn't really good, nor in good form. Um, so, yeah, it... it I think there's a lot to be had here from Crystal Palace, especially on a three-game slate, to do a defensive stack and then chase them with an extra player and hope Cardiff don't score at home while people chase Cardiff. Uh, So Cardiff aren't void of options themselves. They're just in a really bad spot right now. Um, They are the final relegated team. Uh, Let me rephrase that. The English Premier League, the way it works is that the bottom three teams get relegated. Huddersfield and Fulham have already been relegated. And then there's Cardiff and Brighton. So uh, Cardiff is a win and four goals behind Brighton right now. And Brighton, in their final two games, play Manchester City and Arsenal. So Brighton probably isn't winning another game this season. Cardiff basically need uh, two solid results and not to let in as many goals as they score, and they'll be fine. Uh, and they should get out of this season, and Brighton will be relegated. And if you haven't really been following Brighton, Brighton was doing fine, and they've just completely fallen off the face of the earth. So, uh, yeah, if there's anyone who deserves to be re- relegated, it's definitely Brighton over Cardiff. But, uh, yeah, um, Cardiff has lost back-to-back games, but they were against Liverpool and Chelsea. But they've also lost four of their previous five and eight of their previous ten. They haven't scored in six out of their ten, six out of their previous ten games. Uh, it's, it's scoring has been a problem as well, which again lends itself back to don't be shy about taking some Crystal Palace here uh, defensive stack. Excuse me, uh, eleven of their eighteen home games this season. However, despite their scoring issues have had at least two goals. So they're not scoring, but someone else is. Uh, Of their nine wins this season, six of them have come at home, so they are a far better home team. Uh, Obviously, they've won six of their 18 home games this season, uh, but they've lost uh, 10 of their 18, uh, losing 10 of uh, their 18 and 11 of their previous 15 at home. Uh, And if you look at Cardiff's results this season, Three times already this season, they've gone through at least three game losing streaks. And if they lose this game, this will be the fourth time this season they've done that. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, Cardiff's here for the taking, but they aren't completely void of DFS results. I would far rather Guida than Etheridge at uh, 4.9K. Uh, Palace just present way better options, uh, whether defensive or attacking, and the attacking to the point that Guida. Uh, you can just fade uh, Etheridge. And let me rephrase this. If you haven't been following my videos or my content for the past few years, um, Crystal Palace don't play 90-minute forwards like like Southampton. They're completely like immune of 90-minute consistent games. So you can just, whoever starts up front, you can safely fade them because you know they're not going to play 90 minutes despite DraftKings giving me the errors. So yeah, uh, no Etheridge. Uh, but uh, Joe Bent isn't the worst idea from 4.2K. Uh, I think there are worse options this slate. Uh, but uh, again, uh, I would prefer Ryan Fredericks uh, over him, that's for sure. And then moving into the midfield, uh, Camarasa isn't as viable to me as someone like Hoylett. And in terms of their salaries, Hoylett is overpriced. Uh, he'll probably average six to nine fantasy points a game for you, which could be fine if he was four to six K in salary. And he's almost seven K in salary. So there's, you're way better spending up on someone like Matinho or spending down on someone like Ruben Neves, who will give you the exact same floor with all sorts of more upside options. Uh, so yeah, 
uh, up front for Cardiff again. Uh, it's a lot of minutes issues. Uh, Rise Healy's been seeing minutes uh, as subs, which is interesting because he's uh, been in the league for a very long time. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just not a lot to look at again. Draws itself to Crystal Palace uh, getting a clean sheet here, which is really what my point is. Final score. Crystal Palace 2, Cardiff City 0, uh, Zaha and Mitrovic both getting uh, in on the goals. So yeah, that is the video. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, Rotopros.com. Get over, check us out, join our Slack, get involved with our community. Hit me up on Twitter. Uh, hit me up on any of the message boards that you may see me posting on. Uh, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six on all the main sites, and on DraftKings and FanDuel. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in, everyone. Take care. Good luck. And uh, whoever qualifies for the last king of the pitch seats, kudos to you. Uh, I hope you are proud, but uh, I'm coming for it this week. Hopefully, you will see me at the top this, this late, everyone. Take care. And most importantly, may the fourth be with you, everyone. Bye.